thank you again for joining Searching for Answers. And I want you to know, since we're in the book of Revelation, we are truly searching for answers. But I have some real good people with me that know the Bible backwards and forwards. And so I'm Carolyn Thompson, and my helpers tonight are... Uh, thank you, Carolyn. I'm Gerald Winslow. I teach religion at Loma Linda University. I'm John Jones. I teach religion at La Sierra University. And I'm Ivan Blaze, and I'm trying to... I know something about going forwards, but I'm still trying to learn the backwards part. <laughs> so anyway, I teach at Loma Linda University. All right. Too. See, I told you I had experts with me tonight. Uh, if you'll get your Bibles, different versions if you have them, and follow along with us as we study the book of Revelation, go to chapter 11, and we just completed the couple of the first, what do you say, first three verses or so? Uh, two verse six probably. Yes, yeah. and then we're going to continue on. And John, do you want to read starting verse six for a few verses and then we'll verse go seven. back verse and uh, see, yes, yeah, verse seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, talking about these olive trees and lampstands and these witnesses, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. So beginning with verse 7 now, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends from the bottomless pit will make war upon them and conquer them and kill them. Mm. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is allegorically called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. And for three days and a half, men from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and, and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. Mm. Wow. This is really... What? What are they talking about, Jerry? Well, I'm sure glad we've got some good help here well. because you and I are going to need it, aren't we? That's right. Well, what becomes evident from the beginning is that there's there's a beast that comes forward from the abyss. Mm -hmm. um, I learned Greek a long time ago, and uh, the abyss, Ivan, the abusas, what, what is that? Uh, well, that's what is translated in uh, Revelation 20 as the bottomless pit. pit. Mm -hmm. And that's right. also what is found in this... Uh, uh, sixth uh, trumpet, too. Mm -hmm. uh, they ascend out of the abyss. Where is that text? Is it the sixth or the fifth? Yeah. Uh, maybe the fifth. Um, it says in the smoke, this is the fifth. It has to be the fifth. Yeah. It starts in the nine, chapter nine. Nine, one and two. Yeah. The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit, and that's this, that's the same word there. Mm -hmm. And he opened the shaft of the bottom of his pit, and from the shaft arose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace. And from that shaft, and out of that smoke, verse 3, come these horrifying locusts, which don't eat plants, strangely enough, but they go after people. Mm. And you can compare verse 11 as well, as, uh, continuing that same picture, isn't it? Yeah. So, and here it is, is again, so this beast comes from the bottomless pit and attacks, and, and who, who's the them who get attacked, overpower and kill them? Are these the witnesses? These are the witnesses. That's mm -hmm. what I thought. The, the beast comes out of hell, mm -hmm. to, yeah. to put it plainly. Sure. Mm -hmm. Comes right out of hell, the deepest, lowest place. And goes after these witnesses. Goes after the witnesses. Mm -hmm. And somehow or other is able to ki kill them, but not until they had finished their testimony. Their testimony is not cut short. Mm -hmm. They give their testimony, and then the beast comes, and uh, actually, interestingly, Jesus is usually, as the lamb, is pictured as conquering, mm -hmm. and the people of God are called to conquer. So by the, he, by the time we get to verse 10, it's looking pretty bad for the witnesses. It is looking. They, they've, um, it looks like they've lost. It looks like they've lost. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's not always guaranteed that we survive this world and this life, is it? I mean, no. we, we were raised on the stories of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, mm -hmm. who uh, could walk in the fire of the burning furnace. That's right. Uh, and it didn't touch them. But when we look at the, those great heroes of faith in 
well, in, in Hebrews <laughs> chapter 11. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty triumphant at first, but then the tone changes, doesn't it? And here they are, wandering the face of the earth, uh, some not surviving. Sawn in two. Uh, yeah. yeah. All, all, so, all, so they're suffering. Yeah. But this has to mean that for the people of God, even though they give their faithful witness, yeah. their faithful witness is precisely what leads them to be attacked. Yeah. That's right. Because they have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so, 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 so this, this says that even though you give God's message, you can expect yeah. that the powers of hell, the lower regions, yes. will ascend because they want to knock you out uh, completely so that you may never arrive, arise well, again. Who are these powers and why do they, it seems like there's a, some kind of a <coughs> terrible war going on between the good guys and the bad guys. Without a doubt. So why are the bad guys doing this? Why don't they join us and be good? I that's, mean, that's, that's something, did you ever think of it that way? Well, sure. They, they know the Bible backwards and forwards. They know the prophecies. Why do they persist in trying to hurt these two good guys, the two witnesses? That's their nature, and I don't know why. I, I'm with you. I wish that, you know, it's like, you know, they, at the end of the chapter 9, they didn't repent. No, they didn't. See, why don't they repent? Why don't they? I don't know why those who are evil do not repent when they don't. Some people who have lived in that camp do come over to the other side. Yeah. And if indeed all have sinned and come short of God's glory, then we were all on one side, you might yes. say, and then we've come over and God is calling out a people. Yes. And but these the powers of history want to destroy these are the secular powers. Well they you know, in first century Rome they would worship this is the emperor and his, his folk. Yeah. Who yeah. come and strike down those who give their Christian tem uh, testimony. Mm -hmm. And down through history the same has been true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think that's part of what is really the mystery of iniquity in the New Testament. Yeah. There's something just implacable about the core of that rebellion against God, isn't there? Yeah. He now, used the word implacable, and I'd like you to notice that. I heard that, but I let it pass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to struggle with my voice a little bit, but I want to ask this question anyway, if, if you can hear me. Sure. Down through time, there have been many attempts to identify specific powers with these beasts. Yeah. What do you say to that, you, you biblical scholars? Well, look, I, I, should I have you answer first, John? Go, go for it. I can hardly it. wait to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> well, okay, let's, I think let's clarify the question again. Yeah. What is the question in simple language? Well, you've got a beast, yeah. and, and it comes out it, of the bottom. It clearly, it clearly represents evil, yes. without a doubt. Yeah. But should we stipulate it further than that, or how how do you how do you relate that to the various powers that have been? Mm -hmm. Well, I I think um, you know some see the Book of Revelation mm -hmm. um, as a segmented. Def def clearly defined, even to be dated, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. segment a, a series of segments of periods. Yeah. Uh, I and I don't want to in any way um, uh, do away with that. There's a movement from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of uh, Christ in this book, and so on. Sure. And so then, when you're doing it in that manner, you identify it with a specific power. But the point is that down through the ages, people have looked at their times mm -hmm. and what was going. On at their times, yes. and they read the Book of Revelation, it and said, they uh -huh, have that's where we well, are. they've applied. Yeah. That's right. They've applied this book, uh -huh. and it would be strange if we didn't apply it throughout time, yeah. even if it has specific references and specific times. Yeah. It's strange that we wouldn't apply it because otherwise, then you say, well, this is a very nice story, mm -hmm. has nothing to do with me. Yes. There is no yes. beastly power that exists right now, mm -hmm. and there are always beastly powers because the devil appears, the power of evil appears under many guises. That's right. You see? And I, I'd like to quote a text. All right. May I quote Go this for text? It. Yes. Okay, First Thessalonians. First Thessal Thessalonians. Yes, the earliest letter probably of the New Testament, John, yep. would you agree? Yep. Probably is. Mm -hmm. the earliest material of any kind. Yeah. Now um, <coughs> okay, chapter five, 
verse 22. I can't even find it, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, chapter, uh, let's help our, our watchers. Uh, our, okay, our, what is well, what yeah, chapter Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Colossians, Colossians. First and Second Thessalonians. Maybe oh, that'll help. Right after right. Colossians. Right after right Colossians. Colossians. Right before Timothy. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Now you've got I it. always like to say the First Thessalonians oh. comes before Second Thessalonians. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's been some big I understand what you mean. Thank you for your help because I I found Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. That's and wonderful. what were the, the chapters? 522. 522. Yeah. Now I'm going to quote it according to the King James Version, first all of right. all. Where Paul says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Mm -hmm. Okay, which a lot of people have thought to mean, um, well, anything that looks bad, don't get near it. And that's not a bad principle. I don't think this text is quite saying that. But what it means is, uh, the appearance, abstain from, keep away from every appearance that evil puts in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or we can translate, like my uh, new Revised Standard Version, abstain from every form of evil. That implies that evil carries many forms, mm -hmm. you know? And so we should always, if you have the gift of prophecy in your midst, if there's the prophetic spirit in your midst, then you're going to see the powers that are arrayed against God in every age. Mm -hmm. You know, and so in that sense, these powers reappear. And you may be looking at one thing, and that may certainly have been a power uh, that, uh, you know, you could identify as a power that carries this, this description, but at the same time, we should look ar around some more, I do believe, and see if there are other powers. So at the time that John wrote this in Revelation, there were beastly powers then, too, weren't there? Oh, the power of Rome. Exactly. Emperor worship. You're, you're, you're bound to worship the emperor or you'll lose your life. That's right. And what were the early Christians? What was John doing? What were the early Christians in Asia Minor, for example, doing? <coughs> they were witnessing for Christ and they were losing their lives. We see indications of that in the book of Revelation. Well, the reason I pressed the question, even though I was having trouble talking, is that see, I was reading one commentary and it says, this beast that comes up here was the first French Republic. And I thought, well, it's entirely possible that there were elements of truth in that, in that the first French Republic may have acted in ways that were not in keeping with the principles of uh, God's kingdom. Yeah. But there may be other manifestations of that same beastly um, attitude down through time. Well, yeah. go ahead, John. Well, uh, only, uh, only to uh, just uh, reinforce what we're doing right now. There can hardly be a more important principle in interpreting all of the Bible, including the book of Revelation, than starting always with its, what we can recover, imperfectly to be sure, of its original meaning when John first wrote it, because it clearly had real punch for his time and his place and the people who were undergoing all of this suffering and hardship. That at least will set the pathway for our subsequent reapplications. Mm -hmm. The reapplications are right, but in order to set some kind of a control over our reading, we should always work from what the text meant originally, to, originally well, to, to what it means today. Otherwise, okay. we'll wind up just slandering each other and leveling our guns, uh, <laughs> charging each other with being Babylon or whatever yeah. it may be. Sure. There, as we go on, <laughs> particularly through chapters 11 and 12 now, uh, in coming sessions, we're going to find ourselves earmarking again and again these particular characteristic features. It's important for us to catch those as we go. Yeah. Okay. And John, you, uh, you did something last time in the last program. You said, you know, we have John the Revelator, Mm. And then we have John, the gospel writer. Mm. Well, let me go to John, the epistle writer. Yes. And okay. First John, the second chapter. <coughs> I mean, this is, First can you imagine John, it? The, uh, the chapter second chapter, two. verse 18. Now, remember, this is in the first century, we yeah. believe. Mm. And so here's what he says. Children, it is the last hour. Now, can you imagine someone saying that in the first century? But there he is yeah. saying it. Mm -hmm. As you have heard, that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Mm -hmm. So that, you see, in the first century already, yeah. the power of the Antichrist yeah. is present. In fact, that's how we know it's the last hour. Well, that's yeah. what he says, because mm -hmm. yeah. Antichrist always comes before the end. But look at 1 John 4 as well, if you don't mind. Um, 
Well, don't go so fast because I'm still marking <laughs> oh, verse 18 of okay. uh, the first chapter of no. John. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. No. It, was the, it was the second chapter, wasn't it? Oh, second first chapter. John. Yeah. Second first chapter. John 2, 18. 18. There you okay, because I got the verse. <coughs> then if we go to the fourth chapter also okay. of first John. First John chapter 4. Yeah, and we'll start reading with verse okay. 1, I think. All right. Dear friends. Yeah, beloved, do not believe every spirit. That means some must be unbelievable. You, you shouldn't believe them. But yeah. test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have come, gone out in the world. Now notice he speaks of false prophets yes. and, and, and spirits. Then he says, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus in, in the sense of coming in the flesh, mm -hmm. is not from God, and this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in, in the, the world. world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if I take my Bible seriously, and, and the, the, the connection of Revelation John and this John, then, then we have to say that we should be looking around in every age for that which is opposite to God, yes. mm -hmm. and, and uh, pointing it out, and so on. That's the prophetic spirit. Yeah. And if you get to the French Revolution mm -hmm. and you find a power that is uh, morally corrupt and that uh, derides the Bible and so on, then mm -hmm. you say, hey, this is the spirit of yes. you Antichrist. Know, this, sure. this spirit of the Antichrist. This mm -hmm. is the beastly power. Yes. And uh, so on. I think the Bible has given us an indication how we should proceed with these things. Well, would you say that uh, the beast that comes out of the abyss is all through time, every group of people, places, or things that dispute Christ and what he does for us, or talks against Christ, is a, is a beastly power. Yeah. So there's been many antichrists, according to what you ju we just read. Well, yeah, First John right. says already in the first century there are many antichrists. Yeah. So I think we need to, to emphasize that, that all through the ages, there's been anti people who are against Christ. Antichrist means against That's Christ. Right. And someone who tries to replace Christ. You yes. Can. That's the other piece. We're going to have to look at that later, yeah. too. I, I might just want to throw in here. We might just want to throw in Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. Oh, now I'm back to second. I should have stayed there when I was there. Now, let's see. Where is Thessalonians here? Yeah, what is it after and what's it before? Yeah. Chapter well. first Thessalonians, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Just before First <laughs> Timothy. <laughs> That's it. Well, Second Thessalonians two. This is very interesting. Oh, I um, can't even find it. Yeah, it's uh, Timothy. Yeah, it's right there. For Hebrews. Philippians, Colossians, and then the Thessalonians epistles. Okay, go ahead. I'll okay. catch up. Well, look at the second chapter. Okay. Okay. This is, you know, a, a chapter. Second Thessalonians? Yeah. Okay, the second chapter. As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I notice this has reference to the coming of our Lord, yeah. and our being gathered together to him, we beg you uh, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as though the, the day of the Lord has already here. Let no one deceive you, because that day will not come Unless the rebellion, my, my version says the rebellion, mm -hmm. I wish I had a King James, unless the apostasy comes first and the lawless one is revealed, who is destined to, uh, for destruction? He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so he takes his seat mm -hmm. in the temple of God, mm -hmm. declaring himself to be God. I told you about these things. Verse 6, you know that something is restraining him right now. But then verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Wait a minute. Where's verse, verse seven. 7? I verse can't seven. find it. Uh, you can't find verse 7? Well, it's sandwiched between... <laughs> <six> <laughs> I found it. I found it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so the, my point is there's a lawless one coming, but the mystery already of lawlessness is already at work. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so I get the feeling from all these texts that there, we should take the cue from the Bible yeah. And be true, have a pr true prophetic witness, and in every age and every time say, who is it that calls us to a false worship, yeah. and who is, who is it that represents the true worship? Yes. And uh, there are many figures that can be identified here. 
Well, an important point then is that the people who got this message, when they heard about this beast from the abyss, they had a pretty keen sense of who that was being talked about at the time. At the time. Uh, they couldn't help yeah. but apply it to the, the emperor of Rome. And it's, it's appropriate, I think, if I'm understanding what we're saying, to reapply that in what I've sometimes thought of as the if the shoe fits principle. Yeah. Um, if, if, if this description fits uh, later powers, then it's appropriate to apply it to those powers if they're opposing God's people. Exactly. Really and truly. Or arrogating to themselves yeah. the role of God, the That's role right. of Christ, That's right. uh, in a way that would once again lay claim to civil power and authority to enforce one or another religious perspective and claim. Mm -hmm. Well said, John. That and the really Caesars is. did well, that, didn't they? They, they did. Yeah. That was part they of said, the problem. They said, you know, I'm God. Yeah. yeah. That was why so many Christians wound up in the arena with the lions on Sunday afternoons <laughs> right. 2,000 years ago because they were called annually in their local villages before this simple little altar, a simple thing. Just, yeah, simple really, thing. like the golden calf. Yeah, huh? just a pinch of incense. That's all you had And all to you do. had to do was say, Kyrios ha Kaisaras, Caesar is Lord. Uh -huh. you, you get your libellus, you get your letter, you go home yeah. for another, you say, see you next year, you know. <laughs> but they would say, Kyrios ha Christos, Christ is Lord. Mm -hmm. Change one word and yeah. it makes all the difference yes. in the meaning and also in your fate. Mm -hmm. Uh, that aspect of yes. claying claim to our spiritual devotion That's right. in the service of political power that unifies church and state lays the groundwork for the beast to arise from the abyss yet once again. Okay. Well, do you remember the third temptation of Jesus? Yes. The third temptation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you will bow down and worship me, me. Yeah. I will give you, I'll give you the whole kingdoms of the yes. world. Yeah, there isn't anything Caesar might not give if you just yeah. worship Caesar, you know. His favors will be a plenty. Yeah. And he is called, uh, you know, yeah. Savior. He's mm -hmm. called Savior. That's He's called, right. as you said, Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, you know, the true Lord, over mm -hmm. against that guy who calls himself the yeah. Lord. I mean, this is a religious book, and yet it's a political book as well. Political in the sense that it talks about the way uh, human beings have been inclined to use power. Right. Yeah. Right. I remember one Christian theologian saying once, and, and this hurts a little bit, but sometimes we have to admit the truth about the fact that these, these beastly tendencies can even be exhibited in, in the church that, uh, among people who called themselves by the name of Christ. And uh, this theologian was observing there was nothing sadder in the history of Christianity than the tendency to use the power of the sword to accomplish through force what had been failed to be accomplished through the moral persuasion of the yeah. spirit. Yeah. yeah, true. And uh, yeah. One, I think probably one of the things that helps me when I think about studying the book of Revelation is that it does help us to identify two very distinct sets of principles. On the one hand, you can see the principles that operate and dominate on the, the side of the beast. Yeah. And on the other hand, you can see the principles that are characteristic of the side that follows the Lamb. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and that's a big part to me. That's, that's really what the book's about. I think so. You've, that's absolutely it, Jerry. You know, it's really interesting uh, when we recognize the codes that are at work here. That's a popular word these days in reading Bible, the Bible, isn't mm -hmm. it? But there are codes at work, yeah. particularly in this kind of writing, Daniel, Revelation, and other pieces of the Old and New Testament. Apparently, in the time of Jesus, both in the rabbinic and, uh, and Judaic literature of the day, and also in early Christians, there was a whole kind of literature that used these codes. First of all, for Rome, calling Rome Babylon, or yeah. Sodom, yes. as is the case Egypt. here, and <laughs> Egypt. Yes. But now yeah. what's interesting is that not only are those labels applied to Rome, for sure, no question, but now we see them being apparently applied to Jerusalem as well. Well, this is what is yeah. the striking thing about yeah. this. The great city. Yeah. You see, the city, the holy city in verse 2 is going to be trampled, right? Yes. And now we have the great city mm -hmm. that is prophetically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. crucified. Now, he's crucified yeah. in Jerusalem. I'm just reading 
Jesus says, you know, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, How you often? that stone the prophets yeah. and those who are sent to you, you kill them. Yeah. How often I would have gathered you. Your house is left unto you desolate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know. There's an example of reapplication already at work. Exactly, absolutely. exactly. Because Christians were being persecuted both by Rome and by Judaism in this period, weren't they? Well, yeah, right. in John's yeah. time, I mean, the church and the synagogue are having at it. Mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. And you remember, we read already, and I, when I recall this, I, I am also recalling all the things we said about it, because I, I'm hesitant to use the phrase, even though it's in the, in the, in the book of Revelation. Yeah. You know, in the early churches, John speaks of the synagogue of Satan. Of Satan. Yeah. And then he, those who say they're Jews, but really are not Jews. Yeah. So he, he's leaving room for Jews to be true Jews, and so on. But, um, Jew, Jerusalem, yeah. becomes a cipher, believe it or not, for the opposite side. Yeah. The dark side. The dark the side. side. The dark side. Yeah. Okay. And those who are really fundamentally good are part of the people of God. It, that tells me that even the people of God, any people of God, can go astray yeah. and can become a part, as you say, of the yeah. dark side. I guess the only, the only queasiness I have about that, in all honesty, is that that it, the, the sad history of Christianity when it comes to anti-Semitism. I know. Uh, yeah. it, it seems to me we almost always have to drop a word in there immediately and say, mm -hmm. we're not talking about that. Well, we have to remember where John was in time. Mm -hmm. And then in our time, where there's been a lot of rapprochement between Christians and Jews, which is very good, you know, yes. we have to remember that. And we have to be careful how we use this. And if, if Jews were to hear us, using this, we have to assure them that they may have a part in God's people and all may have a part exactly. in God's people and they're not, you know, but John can take that language and raise it up to this level. And on that wonderful note, dear friends, we hope you are enjoying studying with us on the book of Revelation. And until next time, this is Carolyn Thompson for Searching for Answers. Well, we went about one.